This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Jen Meyerson. Meyerson is a painter whose process relies on computer graphic software to warp and randomize source imagery to create a kaleidoscopic effect while exploring themes of American culture and scientific concepts such as retro causality. The result is an invitation to linger and consider the order hidden in the brightly colored chaos. The conversation includes discussion of Meyerson's birth in Korea and adoption by a Jewish family in Minnesota, finding his place in New York, and ultimately winding back up in Korea via Paris. In addition, Meyerson discusses the evolution of his work in his new Joyeung Gallery show with Korean artists Park Sebo and Lee Bae at the Rink Level Gallery of Rockefeller Center through July 23rd. And now, a conversation about origin, emergence, and return with artist Jen Meyerson. Jen Meyerson, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense Podcast. Jen, you're currently in a show organized by Jo Young Gallery uh, that's going on at the Rockefeller Center through July 26th. It's a show called Origin Emergence Return uh, with Lee Bay and Pak Sobul, big names in Korean art. Jen, you have such an interesting story, but I, I always like to start with artists with this hypothetical, which is if you're at a dinner party, sitting next to somebody who has no idea who you are, what you do, what your work looks like, where do you start to describe what it is? Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be with you, Craig. I'm um, just thrilled to be able to talk about Korea and the show and, and you know, about my own journey. Um, I grew up with a, um, a father who is uh, was a history professor and um, uh, Jewish American out of the Bronx. So our family tradition was we would always kind of, you know, stir stir the the conversation. Um, he's he's a bit of a uh, you know contrarian. So I would probably say something like I um make paintings that are um locational uh and deal with um two narratives uh one is um image sampling as a kind of post-colonial recovery method and the other is uh because when i moved to new york um I did so with like a head full of Adorno and painting had been declared dead. Um, I deal with this kind of impossible potential of extending the living history of painting as a viable form of contemporary art. You know, that's in many ways kind of sums up what I do. And so I, I guess that might be confrontational in some sense, not like pleasant, uh, you know, dinner time conversation, but that's probably what I would say. And it would kind of vet my relationship with the person because I, I don't like to dumb things down. I don't like to, I want to be as inclusive as possible, but I don't want to pander, you know? The image sampling, the the post-colonial, it, it doesn't quite paint a picture of what your work looks like. I guess that's what Instagram's for nowadays, right? Well, I guess hopefully it's enough of kind of a, a declarative uh, statement that more questions follow. Because ultimately, conversations about art and, you know, obviously specifically about my own art are and good conversations are such a luxury, you know, um, the, when I, um, think about my own work, it's always been centered on painting. 
you know, it comes from a kind of Boise and survival instinct. Um, the way the boys talks about his experience of, you know, being a World War II uh, pilot in the Luftwaffe and crashing and being rescued. And for me, that, um, that point, that, that kind of ground zero of my practice comes from my transition uh, from an orphanage in Incheon City to the gravity of American culture in 1976. And so I came over with like one uh, change of clothing and a love of drawing. And I spoke no English. Um, I was about five years old, although all my birth records have uh, are fictionalized and they were estimates. And um, so drawing was something that I had developed a love of and, and some sort of skill at, you know, and in this, you know, drawing is so many things. It's, it's uh, hand-eye coordination, it's uh, proportional recognition. Um, but what it was for me was when I would make a drawing of something, I would not only understand like the definition of cow, but I would also understand the meaning of the thing, you know? And so image making, mark making has always been a discovery of meaning. And uh, my work is, is at its very core meaning based. Um, although it ex exists within, you know, the appearance of painting. I think you've wonderfully opened the door to what what I think is an amazing part of your story, and that's just sort of the the chronology of your journey, right? You know, there there's just a lot about what is going on in your practice, and a lot about what's going on with this particular show that's up at the Rockefeller Center is just terribly poetic, right? And yeah. You're you're born in Incheon City, uh, 1972. You know you come to the states five years old. You arrive to a totally foreign environment in Minnesota, right? Yeah, yeah. In a very small farm town in Minnesota. I mean, I had a I had an amazing childhood. You know, um, I I didn't think so when I was a teenager. <laughs> you know, <laughs> looking back, I mean, oh my goodness. You know, um, you know, I'm a parent now, so you d I don't think you really understand anything about life until you become a parent, you know, right. because then you, I mean, I, I kind of refuse to listen to people, um, about anything meaningful and uh, unless they're parents, because, you know, it's like, once you have this responsibility that, um, supersedes your own, a lot of stuff comes into focus really, really quickly, you know, and um, in kind of introducing both the show, um, which is titled Origin Emergence Return, and my own involvement in it, uh, because I have always been in this alternative space that is neither, uh, you know, uh, my adopted Swedish American mother or my adopted mm -hmm. Jewish American father's uh, physical um, identity. Um, but, and, and I've also struggled with being Korean, you know, on, on, it's like, it really is this alternative space. And, and, you know, I know it's such an important moment right now for us globally as a species. Um, certainly in, you know, New York, in a New York art world, which is still kind of what I consider my hometown. Um, identity art, um, you know, both in terms of points of heritage and points of gender and points of sexuality and the kind of reparation of attention um, are such an essential part of how we find uh, a point of uh, a, a vantage point of like healthy, complete, um, you know, 
uh, holistic um, uh, oneness, right? On the other hand, it's it's as predictable as it is beautiful. This moment, you know. So it's like, who's next? Okay, what's the next point of heritage? You know, it's like, okay, we've covered this this area, you know, and and I see this, and I have always differentiated between identity and presence. And presence for me is accessible by anyone at any time. And identity is really rigid, you know, and and I think I'm able to do that because my uh, my adoption, you know, uh, because of, you know, these constant points of acclimation. And so when I see people or I see situations, I see art, I see artists, it's, you know, it's like not all of that falls away for me, you know, and it and it and it's a, a judgment of of taste, but it's a judgment of quality, you know, and and I think that's um, maybe something that um, is a, is an eventuality, you know, um, I'm not sure. Uh, and, I, and I think maybe that's limited because I see this moment is really essential, you know, in, in the process, in this kind of process of, of reclamation and wholeness, you know? So um, I, you know, all understanding comes through a certain generalism. Whenever I talk about Korea, um, I do my best to explain what a rich ecosystem it is and to kind of break the monoculture, you know? So, I mean, Korea is, I I'm so incredibly proud of us as a community, as content creators. You know, we're the only ones that have made a dent in the cultural dominance of America. You know, if you think about it, it's like we're the only ones that have that can say that that our cultural output, our cultural content um, is a, a viable uh, option, right? And I'd make two points. One is it's incredibly important to understand that all these Netflix episodes, you know, that every all the movies, all the art, Okay, K-pop is a whole nother story. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> it, I, I don't, I don't want to get into that. Right. I mean, it's like there's a long tradition of, you know, Backstreet Boys, Menudo. I mean, we could just right. go on and on about this, but, but in terms of like the stories, the narratives, the things that make us all binge watch, you know, these things. This was made for a Korean audience, right? It wasn't made for export. Meaning it's an indica it's an indication of how sophisticated Korea is. Mm. And so um, there's a term in Korean, um, which is uh, called Han. And Han is like this undefinable word. Um, Han exists within every culture. It, it's an, uh, it's, it's uh, an appreciation of, of tragedy, you know, the bittersweet um, elements of loss. Uh, and and it um, eventually pulls us into a state of overcoming. But it's always through the framework of uh, an unspeakable event that needs to be overcome. Uh, you know, it exists certainly within Russian literature or Irish poetry, you know, um, the long tradition of Jewish comedians and African American comedian. I mean, you know, this 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 is something that exists um, in every single culture, um, and but it's 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 defined as Han in Korean, and all the content that's been created in terms of movies, TV shows, and you know, it's like all my favorite songs are sad songs, you know, or have have you know, it's like. I have that that inborn, I guess, maybe part of my aesthetic DNA. But I think we can all appreciate that on, on some terms. All of that comes from a 2,000-plus year history of cultural creation. 
you know, Korea is as old as any European culture. Um, it, it has existed for as long as any other uh, G10 country culturally, you know. And so I think there, there needs to be an idea of Korea that is, is really rich. And that's where this exhibition comes from. And that's where my, my personal journey, my personal story, it, 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 it's parallel. It runs in complete parallel proximity to, to contemporary Korean history, you know? You were mentioning back there the, the communicating identity versus presence. Hmm. And do you feel like your work tries to reconcile that? Do you feel like your whole life is trying to reconcile that? I, I remember in my 20s, uh, I had a good friend and she uh, had been adopted as a newborn from Korea mm. by uh, a very white Anglo family in California. Mm. And I remember one time her saying, I love my parents and they love me unconditionally and I wouldn't trade them for the world. But there are times when they just can't understand you know, mm. they just can't understand me. It's hard for them to even understand how it's different for me walking down the street versus their experience. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, it's really serendipitous. I just had an interview on Tuesday with the New York Times uh, Seoul desk chief, and they're running an article. I mean, just another shout out for the Korean community. You know, not only do we have free Seoul, but the New York Times has moved its shifted out of Hong Kong and is now squarely headquartered in Korea, which brings a lot of really wonderful critical journalism. It's part of my morning ritual. I, I go through stories, uh, but they're running a, a article on adoption. And one thing that I have been able to experience through the generosity of my wife, my Korean wife, and the art world, which I think is extremely rare, I consider myself so incredibly fortunate, is to be able to come back here and find that rarest of things. And that's a real Korean family. You know, most adoptees grow up with what I just refer to as this missing limb syndrome. Like we know that there's something missing, you know, the, the, the arm that was severed still itches in our dreams and our unconscious. I had in a lot, in a lot of moments in my life, I was like, man, I wish I would have just come over as a baby. You know, I had these episodic memories, like these kind of Proustian recollections of fighting for food in the orphanage. Um, the first night, you know, my parents bought me in the States this amazing, nice bed that floated off the floor. And I woke up with this feeling of like displacement, but oxygen deprivation tank level displacement, because I'd been so accustomed to sleeping on the orphanage floor next to, you know, my, my, my peers, right? Mm -hmm. Like those memories, I was like, why, why do I still need to carry this stuff with me? Like I, I wanted to exercise that stuff. And I think, you know, wanting, you know, that first story I told you about um, drawing as an understanding of meaning, and then this act of exorcism, those two things. Have, I mean, I was a, I was an artist, as soon as I landed in Minnesota at the age of five. You, you know what I mean? Like, there was no other choice for me. This was this was just what <laughs> I needed to do. And 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 uh, yeah so but in explaining adoption to other adoptees um if i could just take a second to do that imagine what is possible after war anything is possible i mean walking through the streets losing your family having no food having no means of getting food what is possible survival I mean, it's the only thing that matters. Um, there was a, uh, just to refer to the New York Times again, just to, like last month, there was this article about uh, this nationalized prostitution, which occurred in Korea. So one of the major social political overlays of Korea is our 30 year 
colonization period by the Japanese empire. Right. Right. And no country did more for World War II reparations than Germany. And no country has done less than Japan. And, and that's just what we face here. And so Koreans have, you know, e our current president, who is not, shall we say, well respected, <laughs> um, he, he, he has made some overtures of, oh, everything is suddenly fine and let's just move forward. But Koreans, as people, still want reparations and, and still do deserve reparations. Um, but adoption, and, and a lot of that has to do with this idea of comfort women, it's referred right. to as, right? So the Japanese military would literally kidnap women from all over, and not just Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, China, I mean, everywhere where they were, and force them into prostitution uh, to benefit, you know, their soldiers. So, but this article that just opened up the door, when after the peace treaty, I mean, Korea is still technically at war, you know, it's, it's bifurcated, but there is no um, I, I actually, there was no peace treaty, rather. It was just like a ceasefire that was signed, right? So after that point in like 1953, North Korea economically was better off than South Korea. I mean, it's really hard to imagine, but they were like, they were doing much, much better. And the South Koreans were like, what can we do to keep like the American GIs here, to keep the foreign troops here and make money? And so they created this uh, system of nationalized prostitution. And in the domino effect, so maybe the first domino is Japanese colonialism, and then, and you, you know, you, you move up. What happened was Korean adoption policies were created to get rid of these mixed race children. So through this nationalized prostitution policy, all these mixed race children were being born. And the Korean government was like, what are we going to do with these kids? And they're like, okay, let's make adoption legal. And through that small window, suddenly adoption became an industry. And make no mistake, we, we were sold. I mean, we were the only country where you could like Amazon us in, um, in the history of adoption, you, as, a, 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 you know, as a prospective host family, you didn't even have to visit Korea. They, they never, they, they didn't vet anything. You know, my parents, I think, paid upwards at the end of the day, you know, close to 10,000 U.S. dollars. What is that? And that's in 1976. It's like, wow. what is that in today's money? Right. Prostitution policy started in 1950, you know, early 50s. They nothing was documented until the 70s or 80s um, and very poorly. So in the 70s and 80s, over 200,000 200, Korean children left via adoption times, you know, what is it, you know, five to 10,000 US dollars. It's a bill, it's billions of dollars, you know, and, and it, it, this is just part of the history of adoption. So to adoptees, I would just say there are many parts of this history. And, you know, we were, victims of something that is very sinister and still subverted but please do not forget the sacrifices of your birth parents and the sacrifices of the people who opened their hearts and homes to you because they they were not complicit in this process it was the korean government it was the adoption agencies you know a lot of these were christian organizations there was a lot of money a lot of money made so anyway that's my just to spin off on that. No, that, no. like the tragic tangent of green adoption. But you know, it, it it's really like that. Me coming to terms with that process, because in the end, we can demand reparations, but we have to be good on our on our own terms. Like we have the power to make ourselves good. You know what I mean? Like right. We can sit and shout angrily from the sidelines, and this doesn't matter what. And it's not, this is not, I'm not saying that we don't need that to be part of the process because we definitely do. Like, you know, we need to protest, we need to have reparations. But at the end of the day, our sense of wholeness can only be created by ourselves, you know, and that's just like 
a fact of life, you know? You know, there, there had to be an identity crisis for you at some point, you know, coming out of Minnesota, mm. finding your identity in New York, eventually finding your way to Hong Kong and to, to Korea. And when you get to Korea, you probably no longer spoke the language, right? No, I, I'm I'm terrible. Like I'm I, I actually lived in Paris just to backtrack. Like I, I did this global odyssey. Right. <laughs> right um, like, you know, I left New York. You know, I left New York because I I did not have the interweb to look at art. I looked at things in books. Um, I was a total geek. You know, this is one of the side effects of growing up with a ex-history professor father. Um, so, and I and I had never had enough money to go look at the grand, you know, the grand tradition of painting. You know, my father's from New York, so we we went to the Met and the Frick and all these things, but it just kind of wet my appetite because all the really good stuffs where where it was made, you know. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Paris. I was working mm -hmm. with a world recognized gallery, which was based there, Gallery Periton. Mm -hmm. And I then had the opportunity, the Korean art world somehow found out about me. And this is like, before social media was invented, I think. So <laughs> they they were digging. I mean, they were like, you know, Korean, that's one thing about being Korean. It's like, if you meet other Koreans abroad, they're like instantly friendly. They're like, right. oh, you know, <laughs> it's like this, <laughs> this like membership to some club, which frankly, I did not always want. I mean, never, it was like, you know, um, I don't think I ever had, I mean, certainly I had blips where I was like, yeah, I'm not Jewish. I'm not Swedish. But maybe part of it was growing up in a community that I did. You know, Minnesota is a wonderful place. It, it generally is open and liberal and you know i had this conversation with um a friend of mine who's the the regional desk chief of the times and obviously minnesota has a lot of history and and the recent events um that caused a huge crisis in the states you know erupted there but my point was like listen it would have been wholly different if this would have happened in wisconsin like if this ha if this event happened in wisconsin I think we as a nation, as Americans, would not had the same amplification from ground zero of that event because it, it was really like an immediate reaction of like, this is so fucked up, you right. know? So, um, but I, I didn't, I mean, I knew, I always knew who I was. I think a lot of people around me had identity crises you know like they didn't know what they're like why is this like you know short uh ethnic guy you know so demonstrative <laughs> like he seems like an old an old jewish new yorker on one level you know <laughs> and like um but you know i've i've always been besides the adolescent years and all the the clunky sexual you know kind of you know broken hearted episodes and all these other things i mean i i was always really like i knew who i was i knew who my parents were um i knew what i had in front of me you know certainly but i also i was in a show at just to backtrack a second i was in a, i was in last year's venice biennial um and I was part of a show that was put on by the Gwangju Biennial, and it celebrated Korea's Tiananmen Square event, right? So just to put this within a historical context, I left in 76. I was born sometime around 72, somewhere around Incheon City. That's just kind of for conversational clarity and simplicity. That's just kind of where it's, it's located. Um, but in 1980, um, there was a pro-democracy demonstration in Gwangju, Korea, and the Korean um, president and military flew in airborne divisions, and they started just shooting at people in the streets. Mm -hmm. And like hundreds 
of thousands of people were killed for for pro democracy. And this is like 1980, wow. right? So it's really like, and and I was so honored to be a, a part of that exhibition. And again, I go back to the generosity of the art community for for. Uh, um, I, I guess I did have some sort of question about whether I was Korean enough or not. But ultimately, that sense of belonging comes from ourselves. It, I mean, it doesn't matter what other people say, you know, and and maybe that was maybe I was arrogant, you know, uh, overly confident. But I've always felt like if I feel OK with it, then it's good. And it took me a much longer time to feel like I could belong to the Korean community in any way than I ever did. Well, certainly New York. I mean, New York belongs to the world. And and I think that really helped getting to go there as a kid, you know, a couple times a year with my dad. Um, but and then like my grandparents, my Swedish American grandparents who helped drove me around in the back of their Lincoln Town car pointing to cows <laughs> back in the day. They were they were like the local small town bankers, you know, so like they were so and they were they were like such pillars of the, the community that everyone just kind of accepted me, you know, so I think I was really fortunate. It, it there, there are not only, you know, of course, race things, but there are class things that are involved in, in these conversations. And I, I was very fortunate to, to, to be adopted into the family that I was and, and ultimately to escape a Korea that was just a clusterfuck. I mean, it was just, it was such a poor, like wild west situation of orphanages were huge money making business ventures i'm in talking to my father-in-law um a few years back when when i was able to be, become a part of his his history um he's he was born in south korea his parents were north korean and they left two daughters behind thinking that they would be able to come back and they, they never got to see them again, oh. you know? So it's like when you, for adoptees who were born in the seventies and eighties and even nineties, like we're still, yeah, we're producing amazing content. We're creating amazing art, but we're still dealing with um, reparations, you know, and you have to imagine an ecosystem that's doing all this at once, because that's really what's happening. And I think that's what makes Korea so profound in some sense. And I think eventually we'll get to a point where our own sense of history is like we're OK with our own sense of history, but we're not there yet, you know, uh, but maybe that's what makes our art even more potent, you know. Um, in some in some way, where in your journey did the the door to the technology open for you? Because it, I, in my mind, twenty five, twenty six years ago, I feel like you had a world of technology revealed to you and started using these tools for your own means. Where did that happen? Yeah, you know, I stumbled into it. You know, I'm I'm not an idea person. I, I'm really a meaning person. And I moved to New York after, um, you know, you and I talked about PAFA, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. So I, I mean, I went, I, I only applied there and one other school. And I, I knew that I was going to go there and I was going to get to work with people like, you know, Bo Bartlett, or at least hear him lecture, Sidney Goodman, Vincent Desiderio. And, right. you know, I, I knew very clearly the limitations of what they did, but I also knew these were the only people that really knew painting. You know, I mean, in the history of, of PAFA, that's the U.S.'s oldest art school. The original founders, William Merritt Chase, Frank Uvenak, all these guys, they got to study with David in Paris. Like there is a direct... Right. mainline transfer of information that has come through this institution. And I wanted to be a part of that. You know, like I knew the critical thought that I had, which, which makes me 
a horribly insecure uh, person <laughs> um, that, but I knew I would have to like, just quiet that and go because I really wanted to be able to have the technical means to not have a cop out of like, Oh, well, you know, or just one way forward. Right. You know, and again, I think this goes to the kind of shotgun, you know, the kind of buckshot lexicon of my heritage, you know, so it, 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 I always wanted like different options within that. And after PAFA, I moved to New York, I, I was able to, while I was at PAFA, I had this existential crisis and I almost failed. Actually, I should tell this story. <laughs> I, I was working on one painting and it wasn't a, like a massive painting. It was like, I don't know, like six feet by like four feet. It was big enough. Um, and every time it was nearly finished, I would just destroy it and restart it. Okay. And I felt like I was like trying to teach myself, okay, what happens if I do this? You know, what if happens if I use an imprimadura or, you know, what happens if I really blend the, the shit out of this area and I do like taping on the other side? Like uh, one of my um, advisors came in, it was like, look, you know, you may not pass. You've been working on one painting for two years. <laughs> you know, we're not like, you, you know, you, you have to finish something. And, and I was like, it was like this epiphany. I was like, oh shit, you know, I have like I, I only have this one thing in my studio. And then like three months before graduation, I just I finished the thing and 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 it's hanging at the Written House Hotel. These wonderful people, David and Sandy Marshall, got the piece. And and that's and that's how I moved to New York, graduated by the skin of my teeth, and then moved to New York. And I did what every young artist does. I, I worked in a wood shop and weighted tables and almost lost my hand in a table saw oh <laughs> at one point. Like, I mean, it was just like the adventures. You should do an episode on just the adventures of like young artists in <laughs> New York. All these like, you know, the follies and foibles of, of this process of emergence. But, uh, and I, I had this uh, illegal seven flight walk up in a Dumbo area, which obviously before it got all bike laney and you, you couldn't right. do this now but it was it was still really dangerous one of my friends got mugged coming off the york street station and like it was it was a tough area uh but it was beautiful and i took this space and i couldn't afford it um it was like super cheap but i still couldn't afford it and so i invited um one of my college friends who was a graphic designer and he um, had access to um, software that I had never heard of. I mean, 1% of the population had heard of. And it was a very early version of um, Photoshop. And before this, I had always been interested in surrealism. I mean, surrealism gets a, a, a bad name. And it is cheesy, but it's the first aesthetic strategy that allows for juxtaposition mm -hmm. and juxtaposition is a comparative contextual device you know obviously things had symbolism before this within the history of painting but you know it was purposefully bizarre right and and it, and and i think that was something that it always attracted me i didn't really make anything the first couple of years and i was taking these images for magazines um i didn't email or do anything at that point digitally i don't even know if that was possible i i guess it was but i would just go to like hudson news and i was the guy who like they would look at really suspiciously because i looked like i was going to shoplift stuff and i'd sit there for two hours going through like you know all the magazine rack because i could really only afford to buy one magazine right uh, but i and i wanted to make sure it was like an image i could use and and I still do that process, but it's an online process. And um, but uh, and I would take these images home, and I would put slap a piece of tracing paper on top of them, and I was kind of painstakingly doing these like distortions or these kind of Doppler effect visual visuals um, with them. And my roommate, who I played a lot of video games in our off time, and 
and he came in and he was like, man, have you ever heard of Photoshop? And I was like, no, what's that? And it was through that friendship, um, a guy named Ben Markson that, um, you know, that I was able to access this stuff. And, and when I first saw it, I was like, oh my God, this is it. You know, it was just like, it, it just felt right. It was like, this is what I've been looking for, for my, like my entire life. I mean, and it was, I mean, I didn't say those words internally, but it was just like this rush of adrenaline. Even now, when I think about it, it's, you know, I like the hairs on the back of my neck, you know, it was really, it was just such an epiphany. And those early things that I did, like at 97, I guess, summer 96, 97, I, I didn't make any paintings based off of it for almost a couple of years. You know, I mean, I just, I just kept trying to test the limits of what it could do. And we didn't, I didn't, I couldn't even afford a computer. So like my friend would sneak me in when his boss was out of the office and I would like come down, you know, to Chinatown and like, you know, or bar go to a friend's place who had a good computer and we, I would just look at stuff, you know, and, and I started out doing these handovers is the best way to describe them. And I, I, you know, I was using these really obvious kind of macho demonstrative parts of American culture. Uh, I grew up a huge Vikings fan. I, I still follow them online. <laughs> you know, like I'm like they have still haven't won a Super Bowl. It's killing me. Um, but, um, and like H two Hummers, and and it was critical. Like I wanted to show aspects of American culture through these fields of distortion and kind of reflect it back on itself. But at the same time. It, it satisfied those two things that I've been looking for. One was a way to extend this living history of painting, um, because certainly not many people had been using this as a, as a tool, as a device, and painting has always um, been kind of inexorably tied to technology, you know, through lenses and through photographs and, and basically painters have always been looking for that little extra sauce, you know? Um, so there was that. And then of course the most important thing, well, probably one of the most important things was when I stood, when I was looking at this stuff on the screen and it was this very simple thing. You could control the X fact, the X vector, the Y vector and the number of generators. Right. And then you could hit a button and it would randomize it for you. And I was like, every time it would randomize, I was like, holy shit, you know, and it was like this entire context would be put before your eyes. And the painting process, eventually figuring that context out, it was exactly like those first moments in the back of my grandparents' Lincoln Town car trying to understand something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it was so, like the frequency, it was so pitch perfect. And, 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 and you know, but I was like, this was not, supported my fellow young painters were like this is cheating uh you know this is like you shouldn't be doing it like i had so many studio visits like so many failed studio visits and people were like i think anina nose suggested that i find some other line of work besides art <laughs> so i mean <laughs> like i like people were just like this, this is terrible there's no authorship in it but that i mean that's why i loved it you know this is exactly the conversations I'm having with people right now about AI, right? Mm, you know, yeah, yeah. And how um, some people are scared to even use it as a tool to help them because it, it carries all this baggage about lack of authorship. And but there's another group there, like you know, it's a tool. You know, 25 years ago it was Photoshop. You know, it's it's another tool, and that's really interesting. The end result is so far from the origin except for mm. the colors right and so how would you yeah. even, how would you i mean is it was it color that was really attracting you to these images in the first place it's like the whole visual experience you know i mean i and what was really nice about it is like it's this thing that we all need to do or try to do it's like as you're living your life as you're the day-to-day -day grind, right? It's like taking a moment and saying, you know what, this moment 
really matters. This is such a significant moment. I'm going to take this moment and spend, I mean, the, the paintings take months, you know, I mean, really, I, I you know, I, I have the privilege of having a, a couple of studio production people now, but in the beginning, the first like 10 years, that was like everything. Well, the first, uh, yeah, m m mainly was just all me. I mean, I was even building this, the supports myself, you know? So um, it was like that curation of those moments um, as they were spinning by, you know, um, like when I was a kid, I would be sent to summer camp. And while I was there, I'd be like, oh, this is all right. And then I would get back from summer camp and I would be like, that was amazing. You know, and like this kind of reflective, mm -hmm. you know, uh, realization. But when it's there through this randomization software, you have to be pre so present that you can pull that that appreciation out of this, this um, you know, this process that's, that's very active, you know, and, and kind of flashing before your very eyes. And I, I mean, now I have, I haven't engaged, I, well, I have a upcoming solo museum show at Ulsan Museum here in Korea during um, Freeze Seoul, the second iteration. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna do my first video project, but I've been making videos now for a while, for the last couple of years during COVID. Um, and I um, have been really interested in this idea of retro causality. Okay. Um, um, retro causality is something that exists both in parapsychology. So like seances, you know, um, and um, uh, in Korea, actually shamanism and fortune telling are not uh, poo pooed. They're, they're just a, an integral part of um, culture and society and even corporate culture. Um, a friend of mine who works at Samsung was like, yeah, I mean, what well, before we hire a higher level position person, like they have to go through the corporate um, interview structure, but we have a, a shaman in a room, like vibing them out before they get hired. And if there is bad energy there, they don't get hired. I mean, that's like, I mean, think about that, right? You know, so, and uh, before every Korean gets married, they want to know if this is a good match, they go to a fortune teller, they, you know, they, they kind of figure out the best moment to get married. It's, it's relative to a lot of Asian philosophies, but it, it's very specific in Korea. It's, it's refined. I mean, it's, it's operates on a very specific frequency. So I, I became really interested in retrocausality, which exists in that, um, in parapsychology and also in, um, in quantum physics. When I was uh, started my career in New York, I was a studio assistant for Ron Gorchaw, the late great Ron Gorchaw, um, and Ray Smith, the the fantastic American Texas based painter um, who has a deep deep connection with Mexican culture. Um, and I I was working at their um, Smith Street studio, kind of you know part time for Ron and part time for Ray when when they needed me and. They would hold these these events, and one of them was with um, Lee Smolin, which is one. He's one of the preeminent kind of guys, and the other was with this guy Jaron, and I forget his last name, but he's he's the godfather of virtual reality. Oh, wow. And so I think that also kind of like helped me because I was seeing and I was around these thinkers, and like I was able to to pick up a Lee Smolin book, and I was thinking about these things, but on a quantum physics level, uh, retrocausality breaks the linearity of time as we know it. So as we, we all know, the past affects the present and the present affects the future. But in retrocausality, we're able to leap forward into the future and affect the present and even the past, right? So in parapsychology, that's done with shamans and through seances, uh, in quantum physics, when particles get so small, they no longer obey linear time. And this has actually been proven in quantum physics mm -hmm. now, right? So when you get into these sub subatomic quarks and, and what have you, they, they just don't operate within the same 
dimension, you know, dimensions that, that, that we recognize. And the thing that made this really potent for me was because I have no connection to my past, becoming a parent was my way of connecting with my past in some way. Right. You know, so this was incredibly meaningful to me. And I began a network of paintings um, that that are all titled Seance. Mm -hmm. um, and they are um, kind of pictorial, ritualized monuments to the exact moment when my birth mother had to say goodbye to me, oh. you know. Um, and so they're really tender and they're intimate and... And I started by kind of taking my own photos of that, but then I quickly accelerated into LIDAR scans. Um, I've always been interested in paintings that engage with time. Um, I've always thought of my paintings as, because I've moved around so much as kind of locational demarcations of the places they were made in some way. And so LIDAR was like such a, a, a logical, you know, reasonable step for me. And so I've been taking, um, and the technology has become available, you know, like, like Craig, can you imagine us having this stuff when we were like in our twenties, oh, you know, know, it's like the, the, the things that we could have done. And, 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 but so I take these 3d scans of an entire room and my daughter is very reluctantly and my wife very reluctantly, um, sit underneath a bed sheet with their smartphone, um, flashlight on. And it, so it creates a space within a space and, um, and there, and then these, um, paintings are, are created, um, in kind of, you know, trilogies or, um, in, but they're, what's interesting about them is because they're taken from a LIDAR scan and I can like, um, move this thing around. So, so it means you're able to model it in three dimensions, right? And yeah, you can, you yeah. can change your perspectives, right? I can get all these different points of perspective off of this exact singular moment. And it, and it's again, a way to like, you know, sense and the, the to go back to this idea of presence, the, the, you know, share this presence of, of that singular experience um, from these different vantage points. We talked about how there was pushback when people saw this work 20 years ago, but I just feel like the aesthetics of our world have caught up with your work. This generation, we were talking about the generational change in technology. You know, I feel like people can see your work and can sense that there is a bending going on, that there is, it's almost like some of these sci fi shows where, you know, there is time travel going on, whether that's, you know, 2001 or, you know, some you know, time travel place where that they hit the wormhole and pop into this time and place. And when they do, the whole scene sort of looks like uh, a Jen Meyerson painting for a moment, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm, uh, it's a conversation. I think a lot of um, artists of my generation, we grew up with like comic books and, you know, this real analog visuality and, and our imaginations are, defined by these visual inputs. I mean, I was really fortunate, you know, my, the town I grew up in was a thousand people, but my father being from New York, we would go to New York and I was able to see all these paintings. Um, and so that was part of the soup. Um, you know, um, I interstellar, you know, seeing interstellar right. was something I was like, I was like, wow, this is like so inside my mind right now, you know? <laughs> right. And and every and all my friends who had seen Interstellar were like, dude, have you seen Interstellar? It's such a you know, and I and I <laughs> and I was like, Yeah, it was like it was so amazing, you know. Um, let me just say this. I did not intend to be a pioneer of anything. I mean, it wasn't theory based or I idea based for me. I think a lot of artists have great ideas. I'm not that smart. I mean, I, I have been fumbling my way around the world and, and, but it, it's always been like, I'm, I've always been looking for this fulcrum point, you know, and, and it's been really wonderful. Um, and I guess, 
vindicating on some level. And I wish I could go back and using retro causality to these early studio visits and be like, see, I told you so, right. you know, but, um, but it, 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 I don't, I know you had like Emma Webster on, right. you know, it's like, there's, it's so rewarding for me to see these younger artists um, because that affects my work as well. You, you know, I mean, it, she probably has no idea who I, who I am, well, but you no, know, she spent, she spent some time in Korea this, this past year, you know, she had a big show at Periton and, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and it's several times in this conversation, I've thought about what, what she's doing in terms of using technology to create these spaces and then, you know, using yeah. that. And you guys both are just amazing with color, right? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think there, I would make one, I would make a, I mean, there. Are, I'm a detail person. I think the details really matter. So, I but this idea of frontier optics, you know, of of using something that is not either photographic or plain air mm-hmm. as source as as point of origin. I think that's we're both, you know, on that kind of family tree. I, I, every artist exists within a certain family tree. I mean, you know, we're all indebted to artists that have come. Before and and after, I, I think really and after as well. You know that that may be a great entree into promoting the the show because oh yeah, you're talking about a real lineage there. You know, Pike Sebo, you know, 91 years old, who w- was kind of pushing the envelope in Korea decades ago. Lee Bay, you know, and talk about family tree. I mean, there's there's a play on words there also, right? Yeah, uh, just true. his yeah. his use of of the, the charcoal pine. Mm. Tell, tell us, uh, uh, tell us about the show because I, you know, if folks are in New York, they need to go out and, and see this, uh, at Rockefeller center, right? It's the first celebration of Korean heritage in the city of immigrants, um, of New York. And I, and it's just phenomenal. Um, I'm, I got pretty emotional at the opening event because it, it's so incredibly meaningful to have this happen for us as a community. Um, we had a Met um, curator, um, fantastic woman named Iris Moon of, of Korean Heritage, who moderated the artist talk. And I remember going to the Met as a kid, and there was a huge wing devoted to China and a huge wing devoted to Japan, and there was there, Korea didn't exist, you know. So to go from that to this is, in my lifetime, is just phenomenal. And to put it into context, when Park Sebo was born. Korea did not exist. That was still part of the Japanese empire. So within his lifetime, he's seen, you know, the emergence of the evolution. Um, paradigm shift is not a strong enough term. It's a shift of, of, of eons, you know, of, of total context. Um, I think one thing that's really important to understand about the show, a lot of people think that like Park Sebo is the origin and eBay is emergence and, and I'm return. And while that I wouldn't discourage that, it's really important to understand that Park Sebo spent a year abroad in Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, eBay um, started having the opportunity to, to both of those guys chose Paris. Um, obviously, my gap is 30 years um, and has a different history. But all of us had the opportunity to leave Korea. And it was through that distance that we were able to see clearly a picture and, and, and gain a sense of direction when we returned. Mm-hmm. And um, so the, the show starts with Park Sebo. Um, he's one of the founding members of this monochrome painting post-war movement called Don Sequa. And um, post-war monochrome painting has universal occurrence. So, you know, New York school, Ad Reinhardt, Robert Ryman, you know, right. um, Green- Greenberg was such a champion of this kind of, you know, reductive yeah. purity, formalism, autonomy thing. In Europe, you had the the zero school. In Japan, you have like Manoha. And, but in Korea, it is tied to it goes back to this everyday survival, you know? So Park Sebo, he, I mean, his work definitely is within the shadow of 
the Japanese singular gesture, you know, like it, it is post-colonial in its form to a large degree, but the, the meaning and the conceptual framework of, of his work and now through the, the four, four or five decades of his practice, it, it is substantially and only Korean, you know, um, and so we start the exhibition there. Then we move to Lee Bay, who um, comes from a really small farming community um, called Chungdo. And um, I always think when I see Lee Bay's work of this statement by um, Franz Klein, and Franz Klein used to tell the students, you got to paint from your own personal landscape. Right. Um, you know, and I, and it's so, I mean, that is such, it's just fused. His work is fused with, with his personal landscape. The charcoal, um, he said some beautiful and really poetic things, um, during the opening. Um, charcoal is drawn from Korean pine. Korean pine lives about a hundred years, but when it's turned into charcoal, it, um, lasts for a thousand years. You know, it's transformative. It's, um, environmental conceptualism. You know, um, it, charcoal is used as a purifying filter, you know, for water, all these other, it's again tied to Korean shamanism. Um, there's a ritual, um, there's a harvest festival uh for korean um new years called solnal and they'll build this big tp structure the entire farming community built this big tp structure and it's like a giant bonfire and they celebrate and they eat great food and then um and to ensure a plentiful harvest and um then after the fire is burned down everyone takes away a piece of the charcoal it's used like i said for purification it's used um they they hang it over babies' cribs to ward off evil spirits. Um, they add it to soy sauce as like a thickening and a flavoring agent. It's like snout to tail usage. Um, it, it it's just amazing. He Lee Bay also has this monumental sculpture in what has become kind of the crown jewel location of public art in in New York, which is, which is Channel Gardens. Right. Um. And um. And eventually. You, you funnel back uh, to me and you get this like, you know, which way is up, which way is down, which time were these things made uh, since. Um, I do have, um, I have about, uh, uh, I think 10 or maybe 12 paintings there. Um, some of them were just finished like a week before the shipping. One thing I will say, if people are able to go, um, is I have um, uh, these um, uh, augmented reality overlays. So um, I use a QR code, which is placed in front of the painting. And um, this this form, this part of my work, uh, which is extended now, like I said, into video and AR, and um, it was created because I went to the agency that keeps all the adoptee records. And and I had had suspicions that my birthday was made up because it's on Parents' Day. So it's like quite the coincidence that here's this gift of this baby and it's on the National Parents' Day. And they confirmed that the first record of my existence was when someone abandoned me at a public market in the spring of 1975. And before that, there were no birth records. There was there was nothing known. And 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 I. I obviously it was a it was it hit me um, in a in a really profound way, and then I started thinking about how I could present the birth records of my paintings. You know, because I have since, like I said, the mid nineties, I've been working on these sketches, and they only exist as digital material. Um, they don't have any presence at all for anybody, and so I started to create these. AR overlays that you, you use your your hand phone. I'm not into VR. It's too like escapist for me. It's too like fantasy. Maybe I'm I'm just not young enough to, to get into that. <laughs> but I love I I love AR, you know, where you're able to see something digital and real life at the same time. That's like so much about what I do. And so a viewer um is invited to scan the QR 
then lift it up to the painting through this facial recognition, image recognition technology. And there's a whole nother political, social kind of reason why I do that. But uh, the birth records of the painting just explode out and you're able to have um, the digital origin. So the birth records, then the physical presence of the painting, and you're able to move through it um, in your own experience. Um, and I think that's, um, I hope people will enjoy that. That's, it uses social media. It uses Instagram uh -huh. as the mechanism um, uh, because I also am really interested in the idea of social media as a memorial. Um, Facebook no longer takes down um, profiles of people that have passed away. They leave them up if the family requests. And it becomes this kind of living memorial of this person that has passed. And I and I I created this group of paintings called The Impotence of Fire, which deal with the original sketching material and, and thinking about if I were to leave the earth tomorrow and my own children would have something. Where whereas I, you know, our generation, everything nothing was digital, you know. So everything when the orphanage that I that I was in burned down, everything was lost, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an amazing show. Please go. If people wanted to see your work online or out there, I, I think you said that, uh, you're going to have a show coming up in Finland and one in Berlin. Is that right? Yeah. A couple of shout outs and thanks for, uh, letting me talk about these. <laughs> uh, one is, um, at this amazing gallery called Makassini and it's in the, original capital city of finland is a place called turku which apparently is beautiful and part of the uh, finnish archipelago so um it's this major overview um a lot of uh, amazing artists um christy chan from hong kong and harry puro from finland and david sally um tony craig and and little old me um and then uh that opens june 30th so people could at least see that online. And if for some reason they're in Scandinavia sailing, please park your boat at in Turku and, <laughs> and see the show. Uh, and then the other um, thing that's opening, which I'm just thrilled about, and it's kind of like a more, well, it's it's not comparative directly. So, um, but it's a, it's a Korean um, survey show uh, called Dwijip Ki. Um, and that's the Korean term uh, for this specific move in wrestling, um, where you, if you're really a master of your craft, you can like, it's like Greco Roman style, you know, you can flip your opponent over, but you have to be like really a master. But it also refers to an alternative um, idea or changing your mind. Um, and it provides a overview of um, generational, I think about in this case, five generations of Korean artists. Um, and it's presented at the historical and amazing gallery of Esther Schiffer, Berlin. Um, and then also their location here in Seoul. Um, they, they've just opened a branch uh, last year, uh, showroom space. So if you're in either Turku or Berlin over the summer, please check that out and Rockefeller Center until like end of July. Um, you you could I guess the best place to find me is just on Instagram and it's just um at Jen Meyerson. Uh, please don't misspell my name. Everyone just cuts off the first E. So um I have a Korean Jewish Romanian name. It's M E Y E R S O N. Uh so Jen, it this has been uh, a delight talking to you and uh I really appreciate your time today. I wish you the best of luck with uh, these exhibits and uh, your continued success. Uh, I feel like this is uh, just the beginning of a conversation uh, over the years with you. So thanks for spending the hour with me. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, I'll, I'll keep uh, binge watching or binge listening to all your episodes. <laughs> I, I'm such a fan. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. all the time we have for this week you've been listening to art sense you can find the show on apple podcasts itunes 
Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. <laughs>